We discuss in detail how the Holy Spirit leads the believer through the inner witness and through the voice of the Spirit, a very important message for every believer. All right, why don't we uh, rise up to our feet, please, and make our declaration together this morning, and then we will uh, get into God's Word together. So if you brought your Bible, please hold it high up in the air. Let's say this together loud, bold, and strong. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness cannot hold me back or pin me down. The forces of the enemy cannot restrain me or contain me. The greater one is in me. God's power through me is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Last Sunday, we began talking about receiving God's guidance, and we are going to continue uh, in this series on receiving God's guidance. Uh, as we said, all of us uh, need God's guidance. We look for how God is guiding us, directing us uh, in various situations of life. And God is interested. God is interested in all matters of life. Uh, all the decisions we have to make, God is very interested, like we saw last Sunday. And uh, I just want to uh, uh, review some of the things we said last Sunday as, and then move forward. Uh, we said there is no set formula in, in all of this. Uh, but what we are doing is going through these 11 ways, and we see them up on the screen here. Uh, the 11 ways, different ways by which God speaks to us and brings his guidance into our lives. And so we must become familiar with these things so that uh, we are sensitive to the Lord and we receive his guidance and understand his will and purpose for our lives. So we've, um, uh, we will be covering uh, all of these uh, over the next several weeks. Now, some of the things that I, I did uh, mention uh, last Sunday, and I'll just uh, repeat that, is uh, to the course of this series, different ones of us who are ministering to you, uh, will be sharing our personal experiences. And even today, uh, I will share uh, different personal experiences in the light of, you know, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but I want to please remind all of us, please don't base your life on somebody else's experience, right? Uh, you... Uh, all of us have to build our life on God's word and on the Holy Spirit. We can learn from other people's experiences, but don't try to copy it and just do it because you, you know, pastor did it or so-and-so did it. I also will do it. Don't do that. Uh, learn from the experiences, but have your own journey with God. Establish your life on the word of God and on uh, the uh, on the work of the Holy Spirit. Also, you know, when we share these experiences, we'll be sharing specifically about things that relate to what we are talking. Uh, but uh, uh, we keep in mind that other factors also involved. So today we're talking, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, how He guides us. And we'll be covering these three aspects. The inner witness of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, maybe touch a little bit on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We won't talk about that in too much detail. Uh, uh, but while I'm sharing instances in relation to this, uh, remember that in the whole decision-making process, there were other factors involved as well, uh, the remaining of the 11. And uh, I may not be talking about that, not mentioning about it, uh, but don't exclude that. Be uh, be uh, they were there. They were part of the whole decision-making process, even though we share some of these stories. And also, um, please keep in mind, when we share these stories, it is not to elevate any one of us. Right? We're just sharing the stories to say that we're not just talking theory 
uh, these are very practical things. But uh, don't misunderstand the stories as uh, some means to promote ourselves. We don't need to do that. And that is never our intent in sharing uh, these stories. Uh, just to quickly review, last Sunday we talked about the primary way, the Word of God, which, by which God guides us. Uh, so as believers, there are two primary ways. It's the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. So we talked about the Word of God. And in, in talking about how God guides us through His Word, we talked about the instructions of the Word. So if there's an instruction in the Word of God, you don't need to pray about it. Just obey what's already in the Bible, what's already in the written scriptures. Uh, there is a quickened Word. That means God awakens a Word. He come, brings it alive in, into your spirit uh, by His Holy Spirit, the quickened Word. Uh, we talked about the Word that is preached. We also talked about the inner voice, the voice of our conscience. So if you are reading the Bible and you're putting God's Word into your spirit, then your conscience conscience, which is your own voice, the voice of your own spirit is a reliable guide because your conscience will always speak aligned to what is what you have fed your spirit with. If you fed your spirit with the word of God, then your own spirit, the voice of your own spirit, your conscience will be aligned to the word of God. It becomes a reliable guide. So some of you say, you know, you might feel and sometimes, you know, I, I don't feel like I should do it. My conscience is not letting me do it. That's good. You know, if your conscience is not letting you do it, that's good. Because that means your conscience is saying, don't do it. And it's a reliable guide saying, it's not in line with the word of God. Don't proceed. Right? So listen to your own conscience. Uh, but keep your heart filled with uh, the word of God. Today, we're going to cover uh, three other areas. We're going to talk about the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Basically, this is how the Holy Spirit guides us. Uh, and there are two broad ways, the inner, the inner witness, which we will explain, and the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, and also the gifts of the Spirit, which we will touch upon briefly, but we won't go into much depth uh, this morning because we've covered some of that in other, other uh, uh, sermons. So, let's get started. The inner witness of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16. We'll look at a few verses of scripture. John chapter 16, verses 13 to 14. Jesus said this, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Notice Jesus said, he will speak to you. So question, does the Holy Spirit speak? All right, not sure. <laughs> does the Holy Spirit speak? Yes, he speaks. Jesus said, he will speak to you. Right? So the Holy Spirit speaks. He is speaking. Now you and I have to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak. He said he will guide you into all truth. Guide you means he will lead you. He will show the way into all truth. Not only the truth concerning the things of God or concerning scripture. But all that concerns God's truth for your life. How do you live out that truth in your life? He will guide you into all of that. He also said he will take over what I am speaking and speak it to you. So can you imagine you and I have a hotline to heaven. He will take over what I am speaking and speak it to the Holy Spirit will do that for each one of us. And he will also show us things to come. That means he will show you things ahead of time. How wonderful it is if you and I are able to know in advance, you know, what's going to happen five years from now, ten years from now. And then we prepare ourselves for that. That's wonderful. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. He will do that for you. So we need to open up our heart and say, God, did Jesus said this, I want to experience this. I want to walk in this in my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16, another passage here. Paul writes here, he says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, uh, nor has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So there are these wonderful things that God has prepared for you and me. Uh, as believers and also as individuals, there are wonderful things that God has prepared. He's already planned these things ahead of time. But now how are, you, how are you and I going to get to know about these things that God has prepared for us? Next verse, verse 10. Let's read it together please. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You see, God has prepared these nice things for you and me. And He's not, he's not saying, oh, well, I've got some good things for you, but I'm not going to let you know what it is. That's no point. But He says there, He has revealed them to us by His so the Holy Spirit 
wants to come and reveal these things to you. Hey, God has got some great things planned for you. And I'm here to show you what those things are. I'm going to reveal them to you. Right? But there are, there's some more information there in that passage. Verse 11, he says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man who is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So what he's saying is, it is the Holy Spirit who knows all these things, and the Holy Spirit has been given to us for what purpose? So that we can know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Does God want you to know the things he's freely given to you? Yeah, yes, he does. And the Holy Spirit has been given so that you can know the things that have been freely given to you. He wants you to know. All right? So you don't have to go and ask somebody else. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's going to talk to you. He's going to reveal to you. He's going to let you know the things that have been freely given to you by God. Verse 13, the things, these things we, sorry, uh, yeah, verse 13, 14. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So when we talk about these things, the natural man finds it hard to understand. So some of the things we share with you today, you're like, man, that's out of my box. It doesn't fit into my frame. No. But don't look at it from the natural, the natural mind. It says these things are spiritually discerned. You've got to understand them. With It requires wisdom and spiritual understanding to discern these things, to understand these things. So look at them from uh, with a spiritual mind. And last verse there, verse 16, he says, I was 15 and 16. Uh, but who, he who is, judge, is spiritual judges all things. That means as a spiritual person, you're judging all of these things. Uh, yet he himself is judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So in this whole process, because the Holy Spirit is revealing things to you, the end result is you and I have the mind of Christ. That means we know what he is saying. We know what he's thinking. We receive his mind given to us. So as a believer, you can know the mind of Christ. So I want to encourage you to say this with, say this with me. Let's say this together. I have the mind of Christ. I know his thoughts. I receive his ideas. I understand his plans. I understand his ways. I have the mind of Christ. So say this often. Now when you're about to make decisions, say this. Because this is the word of God. It is truth. The Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ to you and me. Right? So now, in this whole process of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, uh, there are several ways in which he would speak to us. And we're going to talk about the inner witness and the voice of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin by talking about inner witness. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. This is where it brings this out for us. It says in verse 14, let's read that please together. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Let's read verse 16 together. The Spirit himself. Bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now notice verse 14. As many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. Or you could say it like this. Every child of God, every son and daughter of God has the privilege of being led by the Holy Spirit. Who's leading you? The Holy What's driving you? What's motivating you? Holy Spirit. He is leading you. Right? He's guiding. He's leading you. And then verse 15 says, you know, we, are, uh, we have received the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit the spirit of adoption. How do we know that we are children of God? It's because of verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So how do you know you're a child of God? You got a heavenly birth certificate? 
How do you know you're a child of God? Because verse 16, the Holy Spirit bears, he is testifying, he is affirming. He is giving you an assurance, a confirmation inside you. And that, the Bible says, is how you and I know that we are children of God. So from this passage, we understand that the inner witness of the Holy Spirit confirms and leads us. Or the Holy Spirit, by His inner witness, confirms and leads. Are you with me? Because he's talking about being led by the Spirit in verse 14. And then, all right, let's go to the next slide, please. The Holy Spirit by, uses the inner witness to confirm and lead. He confirms and leads us by this inner witness. So, now, what is this inner witness? This inner witness is an inner conviction. It is an inner knowing. It's an inner assurance that the Holy Spirit places inside of us. It's, uh, it comes through impressions. can also come through impressions, feelings, uh, sensations that the Holy Spirit puts in you. It's an inner witness. Something in your spirit that you sense that comes from the Holy Spirit. He's bearing witness in your spirit. He's giving you that conviction, that confirmation, that assurance. Uh, he's giving you impressions. He's giving you feelings or sensations in your spirit. So to help us understand, <coughs> I've broken it down into these eight ways, eight common ways by which you and I will receive the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. All right, it's just to help us understand. First, it is a quickening of Scripture. The inner witness can come to the Scripture that is quickened. We saw this last Sunday. But it can also come through other ways, the assurance within. We'll talk about each of these and explain and give you personal examples. The desire within, the knowing within, the prompting, the stirring, the foreknowledge, and the warning. These are all different ways in which this inner witness of the Holy Spirit comes to you and me. And as we become aware of these things and are paying attention, are having a sensitive heart, a sensitive spirit, we begin to pick up the inner witness and we are by it, we are led by the Holy Spirit, by the inner witness. So let's explain this. The first one, of course, uh, uh, the quickening of the scripture we discussed this last Sunday. We will not go through it again. It's basically the Holy Spirit brings to your remembrance, it quickens a verse of scripture concerning a matter you're praying about. And, and through that, he is bearing witness in your spirit as to what you should do and leading you in the way you should go. The second one, which is the assurance within, comes to us through the peace of God. Primarily through the peace of God. So the peace of God working in us serves multiple purposes. One, we see in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says, don't be worried about anything, but in everything, with your prayer and supplication, you make a request known to God. And then it says in verse 7, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. So God's peace uh, protects our heart and mind. Once we've done this, once we've released all our cares to the Lord, the peace of God guards our heart and mind. So when there are other intrusions wanting to come in and disturb your mind and your heart, the peace of God guards it. You can walk in the peace. But the peace of God also serves another very important uh, purpose in our lives. We see this in Colossians 3 verse 15. Let's read this together, please. And let the peace of God... Rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. So it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That word rule simply means, in the, in the Greek, it means to be an umpire. To decide, to determine, to direct, to control, to arbitrate, and to govern. So this peace of God in your heart serves to 
guide you. It serves to uh, determine, to direct, to control your action. Means saying, if there is a peace of God, let it be the empire, the deciding factor in your heart. So, how would we pick up this witness of the Spirit when you're about to make a decision? You say, Holy Spirit, please show me, should I do it or not? Is this the right thing to do or not? And then you look for the peace of God in your spirit. The Bible says that peace and joy, they are the fruit of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who's releasing this in you and me, the peace. So the presence of peace is like a green signal. You can go, go ahead. Presence of peace and joy. But if you feel restless, disturbed, uneasy, the absence of peace, absence of joy about the thing you're going to do, it's like a green a red signal. Don't do it. Pause. Let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. Are you all with me? All right. Those who understand, say yes. Those who don't, say I don't. <laughs> so the peace of God. The second way the inner witness comes to us, or the third way we're talking about now, is the desire within. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That word give in the Hebrew is very interesting because it is a very broad word. And one part of that word, meaning of that word give means He will put. He will form or He will create in you. He will Put it in you. So you delight yourself in the Lord and he will put those desires in your heart. But it also means he will bring it to you. So not only does he put those desires in you, but he also brings those desires to you. That means he gives you the desires. But here's the point I want to understand. I want us to understand that as God's people, when we live in this posture of delighting ourselves in God, then the desires that are created in your heart are actually put there by God. You can say amen. They are put there by God. Don't be afraid of what of the desires that come up in your spirit. Now, I'm not talking about emotions, right? Uh, your emotions could desire, you know, all kinds of food and this and that and all that. But I'm talking about what's in your spirit. That when you delight yourself in God, the desires that are birthed in your spirit are actually put there by God. Look at other scriptures. In, in, John 50, uh, in uh, Proverbs 10 verse 24, it says, The desire of the righteous will be granted. John 15 verse 7, Jesus said, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, you ask what you desire and it will be given to you. So here's a precondition. You abide in me, my words abide in you, then whatever you desire, go for it. So here's the thing. As you and I abide in God, the Holy Spirit births those desires inside you and you just go with it. Many of the things in my own life, and I look back, I did it because of the desire in my heart. And I remember way back uh, in October 1981, when uh, I gave my heart to Jesus, Jesus touched my life. And one of the earliest desires right then was to share the gospel. So I would stop all my friends in class in my school, just share Jesus with them. Nobody told me, you have to go tell people about Jesus. I never attended a sword willing class or an evangelism class. None of those things. It was just a desire inside me. Just started sharing the gospel. And uh, shortly after that, the desire to teach the word of God came. So I started three different Bibles or four different Bible studies. Uh, and I was just in my first year of my Christian faith. But that desire just began to come. I was just following the desire. No angel spoke. Michael or Gabriel didn't come. They were busy elsewhere. <laughs> You know, and no visions, no dreams, no revelations, no prophetic words, none of that. It was just a desire inside me. And I was just following the desire. Little did I know back then that years later I would actually be doing all this. But it started with just the desire in my heart. And just following the desire in my heart. So I want to encourage you as a believer that desires that are birthed in you to do things for the kingdom of God or for the purpose of God, of the glory of God, are, are stirred or are, are put in there by the Holy Spirit. It is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading you by creating those desires. I remember also 1985, 86 in my 11th and 12th grades, a strange desire came into my heart. I desired my heart to be a professional and to serve God. 
Now, in those days, we did not have Christian professionals conferences. We didn't have books on workplace or how, you know, business as a mission or none of those. None of that existed, at least to my knowledge. I never came across any of those things. But there was a desire in my heart. So I decided my 11th and 12th, I'm going to be a professional, but I'm still going to serve God. I'm going to serve God. And all the way up to 2014, that was what I was doing. Whatever, whether I was in college, whether it was in school or college or uh, in, in, in graduate school or uh, um, working right through. Doing that, but also serving God. Why did I do that? Why did I take that part? Simply because of a desire to do that. It was created in my heart. Are you understanding? So follow those desires. As you're with God, He will form those desires and you follow them. Uh, the next three are, are a little similar. Uh, number four, we're going to talk about the knowing within. Acts chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. It's talking about Moses. It says, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not. Now here's something we must recognize. 40 years before Moses saw the burning bush, he understood the call of God on his life. So many of us think Moses received the call when he saw the burning bush. That's not true. 40 years before the burning bush, Moses understood the call of God. How did he understand the call of God? It says very plainly, it came into his heart. It just came into his heart. And he understood that God was going to raise, use him to deliver the people. He understood his life's calling. How? It came into his heart. It was a knowing inside him. The burning bush was just to wake him up. Hey Moses, I told you 40 years ago you forgot. Are you understanding? Just a knowing with him. So the Holy Spirit. Through the inner witness, creates a knowing inside you. You just know. It comes into your heart by the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Of the plans, the purposes, the directions that God wants you to take. See, something as significant as Moses' life assignment first came to him. Not through an angel, not through a prophetic word, not through a dream, not through a burning bush. It came through him simply by a knowing inside him. Are you understanding this? Just know in, inside, in his spirit. The Holy Spirit created that. And, I, and I'm just going back. In my own life, uh, in 1983, but by the time I was 15, I knew my life's assignment. I just knew that God had called me to raise up a church in the city of Bangalore. I knew that one day... I, I, I would be leading a church in the city. I knew that I would be going to the length and breadth of India, ministering the word of God, raising up churches. I knew that at the age of 15. How? It just came into my heart. It just came into my heart. I just knew. I knew that was my life assignment. And so everything else thereafter was centered around that. And that was my focus. I said, God, this is what I'm going to do. So Later on, we moved to the U.S., living there, and uh, we used to travel, come, you know, come to India many times for ministry. Uh, so 1990, I was in the U.S., but throughout that time I was praying, I said, God, I need to know when to go back. When should I step in? I know that's the call. That's the assignment. When should I do it? So in 1999, August of 1999, we, uh, we were here in India doing some ministry. That year, again, it came as a knowing. It didn't come through a dream or no prophecy, nothing. It just came into my heart. It's time to move back. It's time to move back. So then I told Amy, I said, uh, we got married in 1995. So I told Amy, uh, we'll give ourselves one year. We're going to prepare ourselves, move back to India to do this. And so in one year's time, we prepared ourselves. December 2000, we were back. We were here in Bangalore. But how did I know that important decision of, of when to move? How did I know it? It came as a knowing in my spirit. 
Are you understanding this? So pay attention to that because that is the inner witness. It, the Holy Spirit is creating a knowing in you of the plans and the purposes of God. Number five, the prompting. The prompting is a little stronger than the knowing. The knowing comes as, as an understanding. Uh, uh, you, you know in your spirit, it comes into your heart that this is what you're supposed to do. The prompting is a little bit more forceful. A little, uh, the nudge is a little stronger. The prompting of the Holy Spirit. I remember in November, in November 2002, so we moved back in December 2000, uh, February 2001, we started All People's Church. This was a year later, 2002. Uh, we had our office in Artinaga, we're running the company, and we hired a person, a young man named David, uh, who uh, was actually on the company roles, but he was also helping with the admin work for the church. So he's the first person in that capacity, he was helping with the admin work. So I remember one day, this was... Um, uh, in uh, uh, sometime, this was must have been in October of 2002. I was, and I remember that the, that the whole thing that happened so vividly. I was in the office. I was just going about my work, but suddenly there's a prompting coming in. Came into a prompting came into my spirit. It's time to start APC South. Start APC South. Time to start. So I, I got up from my chair. Walked across the hall, went to David. I said, David, we used to call him Prem those days. I said, Prem, call a real estate guy in Jenega. Ask him for a hall. We want to start APC South. So I just walked across. And in those days, we had telephone books. For those of you who don't know what telephone books are, you need to go to the museum. <laughs> but we had telephone books. So here's what Prem did. He opened to the yellow pages. I don't know what, how. He found one person to call, a real estate guy. So he called him. The first person he called said, yes, I have a place. And he told him, it's going to be for the church. We're going to rent it. And he said, yes, yes, yes to everything. Deal done. I've never seen anything happen so fast. And November... Number 22nd, we had our first service, APC South, started. But that's how it started. With a prompting in my spirit, this thing happened. And the fact that he just made one call and got the place, and we stayed in that place for many years as APC South grew. It, it, it was so amazing. But it happened through a prompting in the, inside me. It was a little stronger. And I just responded to that. And I want to encourage you. See, I'm just sharing these personal testimonies. But I want to encourage you. And I want you to understand the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing for you. So I'm no special. I'm just a child of God. And you too are a son and daughter of God. If he's doing this in me, he will do this for you. Because we read those scriptures. He leads us this way. The stirring with the number six is a little bit more stronger than just the prompting. Uh, in the stirring uh, of the Holy Spirit, you feel really moved about something. And I'll just give some scripture references on this. Uh, in Ezra chapter 1 verse 1, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Notice what it says. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. The Lord stirred up his spirit. I look at Haggai chapter 1 verse 14. Here you see God stirring up many people. It says in verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shel Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts there. God. So they were going to build, rebuild the temple. So God stirred up the people. So they didn't have to do video announcements, promotion, nothing. The Lord stirred up the hearts of these people. And I said, we're all going to come and work to build the temple. So the Lord stirred up their heart. Or look at uh, Paul in Acts 17, verse 16. It says, now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. The King James uses the word stirred within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. So here's another way the inner witness comes. It comes through a stirring inside of us. This is much more stronger than the knowing within or the prompting within. The stirring within is even more stronger. Are you with me? I hope the message is stirring you up. Yeah. 
But in this, we just have to separate out our own emotions. So because we can get emotionally stirred about different things. But there's a stirring that comes from your spirit, which is because of the Holy Spirit stirring you up. In August of 1982, so in October of 1981 is when the Lord touched my life. I was just barely a year old in my faith. It was growing. So this is August of 1982. In those years, our family used to attend the Richmond Town Methodist Church. And we used to go to the evening service. And we always sat in one particular row. Right? So we always sat there. So it was the, an evening there in August of 1982. Uh, we were seated there. And I was 13 years of age at that time. And suddenly, while we were sitting there, and I used to enjoy singing those hymns and all that. And now this was, I think, during the sermon time. Suddenly, I just felt stirred, just moved to pray for the people in the church. It was so strong. I just got out. I walked out of the, uh, the, uh, the church. I went to the hall. There's a hall nearby. It was called Stevens Hall. It doesn't exist today. Uh, it's torn down. No? But I went to that hall, and I was just praying, and it was a deep praying because it was a deep stirring and while I was praying uh, crying basically I was praying I said God there are so many people seated there who need to hear Jesus who need to be saved I'm just crying up for the people there in, inside the church and while I was doing that I heard an inner voice now the inner voice I will talk about just a little later all right so this was a combination there was a stirring and there was inner voice. And of course, there was confirmation later on uh, to the pastor. So, so I heard inner voice. And please don't try this. I'm just sharing my experience. Okay. The inner voice just came. And I was crying. I was crying. I was praying. And the inner voice said, ask the pastor if he will give you 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening to speak to the congregation. And I was 13 years old. I had not finished reading the New Testament. <laughs> I had not read the whole Bible. But I was so moved. So I carried it in my heart. The service got over. I got back into my parents. We left. And my parents thought I'd gone out to the restroom or something. You know, so we went. I carried this in my heart. And in those days, every Saturday, I used to go to the Methodist church and spend my time uh, in prayer. So the following Saturday, I went there and I got to meet Pastor. Uh, pastor was Pastor Ravi Joseph, a very good man. And I, I just put this before him. I said, Pastor, uh, would you be willing to give me 15 minutes on a Sunday morning and 15 minutes in the Sunday evening to speak to the congregation? Now I just left it like that. And he said, you know, I'll come back to you in a few weeks. I don't know what he did to process that. You know, maybe he to the committee or what. I don't know what he did. But the following week he came back and he said, Ashish, on that next Sunday, I will give you 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. I was 13 years of age. So I got myself ready. Took my text out of Matthew chapter 7. At least I read that far. <laughs> and so I preached Sunday morning in Methodist Church. Not even a leaf stirred. Nothing happened. I was a little discouraged, but I went back home. Said, well, I have one more chance in the evening. So I came back that evening uh, to that church. And again, he called me up. I preached. And I said, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I, I ask you to stay back after service. Now, in the evening service, there were students from uh, the Bolin Boys School, the Bolin Girls School who were in the congregation. Service got over. And I saw students starting lining up. 30 students from Bolin Boys stayed back. I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. Now, I had read somewhere that you're supposed to do follow-up. I didn't know what follow-up meant. <laughs> I said, okay, guys, what do we do now? <laughs> you know? But anyway, I led them to the prayer of salvation. And again, all of this was not planned. But I said, guys, tomorrow afternoon, I will come to your school. And they told me where to meet. So I was studying in Bishop Gordon Boys School. As soon as the lunch bell rang Monday afternoon, I grabbed my New Testament and I ran, ran to Bolin Boys School, entered to the back gate, no permission, nothing. Pastor Vasudevan was the warden of the boys' hostel. He, he knew about this. So I ran in and they told me where to go. I went there and sure enough, they were all seated waiting. We didn't have any WhatsApp messaging, nothing to tell them, guys, come. They were seated there waiting for me. I started preaching. And I started that. So from my ninth grade to my twelfth grade, 
preaching every afternoon, every school day afternoon. I would do that. Now I became a little famous at a neighboring school, <laughs> cathedral school. Heard about what was happening in Baldwin's. And they said, can you come to our school? I said, let me check my schedule, you know. <laughs> no, I just didn't do that. I said, okay, Wednesday afternoons, I'll come to cathedrals. So four days in the week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I would run to Baldwin Boys School. And, and the crowd grew bigger, so we moved into the, uh, the eating area. There's a shed right next to the football field. Uh, and so we used to meet there in the open air. And on Wednesdays, I went to cathedral school. Again, the same thing happened. The first time I went there, I was shocked because the whole classroom was full. Students were sitting and waiting. So how, how did this happen? I don't know. They were waiting for somebody, for me to come and speak to them. So every Sunday, every Wednesday we would meet. And then we moved again to the grounds. Now we would sit on the, on the side of the ground. There were stairs. And that's how. So for four years, I did that. Ninth or twelfth grade. I, I still run into people who look back on those four years. And they say, my life was touched in those four years. Some of them are in full-time ministry today. They're serving the Lord today. But how did that happen? It was a stirring within. A stirring. Now in those days, I didn't understand. I just went with whatever happened. But today, you know, we can put it in a little formal way and explain things. But it was a stirring that came from the Holy Spirit. And of course, there was the inner voice, which we will talk about later. The seventh one, the foreknowledge within. So remember Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. He will show us things ahead of time. He, can, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what is going to happen in your life five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now. He knows it. And he can show it to you. He will, can reveal that to you. The issue is, are you and I willing to sit down and listen to him? Ask him, what should I do in the next five years? What should I do in the next ten years? I remember 1993, this was May of 1993. I, uh, I was in New Jersey at that time. So I sat down and I said, Lord, I want to I write down what, I, I just did this. I want to write down what I feel in my heart for the next ten years of my life. For the next ten years. So I wrote down, get married. Move back to Bangalore, start a church, start a business, travel for the work of the gospel. I wrote all this down. How? Just listening to what I felt the Holy Spirit say in my spirit. Ten years, all of them were fulfilled. All of them. So that encouraged me and then I started doing it for Decades ahead of time. So I opened an Excel, I set up a, opened a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet. I divided my life into decades. I said, Holy Spirit, what are you showing me for this decade, for the next decade, for next decade? What are you showing me? And I wrote it down. And I go back to it, visit it, update it as understanding comes. But remember, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. He will do the same thing for you. So you, do, you sit down, you listen. Holy Spirit, what should I do in the next five years? What are you telling me? About the next five years, about the next ten years, about life. Because he will show you things to come. You and I must be willing to listen. That was number seven. Number eight. Let's go to the warning within. I don't see it on the slide here. Something. Um, the warning within. Number eight. So... Like the assurance within, this is the opposite. The opposite of the warning, with the, uh, the opposite of the assurance within, which is the warning in our spirit. Uh, I'll just give one verse here in Acts 20, verses 22 to 23. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, Now see, I go bound in the spirit of Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. So the warning within is this. The whole, there's a tightness in your feeling. Paul said, I feel bound in my spirit. But the Holy Spirit is telling me, there is danger in Jerusalem. So there's a warning in your spirit. So you pay attention to it. If there's something uneasy, it's the warning. The apostle Paul said, I feel bound in my spirit. I feel tight in my spirit. 
But that is the warning of the Holy Spirit saying, be careful. Don't step into it. Don't go into it. And so on. So the challenge to you and me is this, to train our spirit to be sensitive to the Holy. Train your spirit. How do we train ourselves? Uh, simple things, you know, spend time in, with, with God in worship, in the word, in prayer. You know, maintain constant communion with the Lord throughout the day. Pray a lot in tongues. Learn to be still, be calm, because we need to be calm to be able to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Uh, spend time with others who are also sensitive to the Spirit of God. Take some time. Train your spirit to listen. Now, I do want to say this, that when you hear or have an inner witness, you need to check and confirm the witness, especially when it's important decisions. So here are just some quick guidelines there on what to check our, your inner witness. You know, ensure it is aligned to the written scriptures. If you feel prompted to do something that's against the word of God, don't do it. It's not the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, number two, ensure that there is no natural emotion involved. Uh, ensure the leading, uh, that the leading glorifies Jesus Christ. It's not promoting yourself. Uh, see if it's aligned to the overall purpose of God for your life. Are there other confirmations to that inner witness? Uh, consider the risk involved. If it's a greater risk involved, then be caref careful. Wait for other confirmations. Are you with me so far? Uh, uh, are you asleep? I know it's very hot. No. So let's quickly review the eight, uh, eight common ways by which that inner witness comes. It's the quickening of scripture. The let's, go, let's read it up together. The assurance within. The desire within. The knowing within. The prompting within. The stirring within. The foreknowledge within. The warning within. So these are all different ways by which the inner witness of the Holy Spirit comes to us. I'm going to quickly talk about the inner voice in a few minutes and I will close. So the voice of the Holy Spirit, we'll skip the scriptures that are on the next three slides. The voice of the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit also speaks. So we talk about the inner witness, which are impressions, which are more based on uh, feelings and nudges, promptings. But there is the voice of the Spirit. The voice of the Spirit means He's speaking to you. Now, when he speaks, there are three ways you hear the voice of the Spirit. One, it is the inner voice. The inner voice is the directives, statements made by the Holy Spirit without audible sounds. Right? So when I'm speaking to you, we are using sound to communicate information. But the inner voice, the Holy Spirit is communicating information to your spirit, but no sound. But it is a clear directive. There's a clear statement that's made or statements that are made. Then there's the audible voice, which you and I read in scripture. Samuel heard the audible voice. The prophets heard the audible voice. You know, that's the audible voice, which at least in our experience is very rare. We've, I personally never heard the audible voice of God. And there, there is the voice of the Holy Spirit in prophecy, which we will talk about a little later. So let me just talk about the inner voice of the Spirit, and then we will close. So how, what is the inner voice of the Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit, let's skip the scriptures. Uh, it, is the, it is the Holy Spirit speaking clearly to your spirit. You're receiving clear information, statements, directions, directives. This is different from the impressions, the nudges, the peace or the no peace kind of thing. Are you understanding that? So let me give you some examples. January 1989. I was in my third year in engineering college in Manipal. So I went to Manipal in uh, July of 1986 for the four-year uh, engineering program. First two years, we were doing ministry. We saw people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I knew, God, you brought me here not just to do my engineering, but I'm here to serve you. And so I was looking for ways to serve God. We had uh, uh, meetings in, uh, uh, in the hall in uh, Hotel Valley View, in the auditorium in Manipal and all of that. That was in the first two years. In the third year, I began to pray. I said, God, there must be something more. What do you want me to do uh, in Manipal before I leave? I only have a year and a half left. What do you want me to do? So this was January of 1989. A few days before I was returned to the campus in Manipal, I was praying at home. I was just praying in tongues. I said, God, please show me what should I do in Manipal. And I can clearly remember while I was praying in the spirit that day, the Lord spoke. And when I say the Lord spoke, this was the inner voice. Not the audible voice, but the inner voice. God said, when you go back to Manipal, start 
We call it that time. Believers fellowship meetings. Every Saturday, you rent that hall in that hotel. Start the meetings. Have a time of worship. Teach the word. Uh, and just keep a box of offering, offering box to let students give it. So along with that inner voice, there was a vision of what I had to do. See, they say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I mean, so that's why I'm telling you stories that happened long ago because you can see the outcome of that decision. So I went back to Manipal. Thursday, January 26th, 1989. It was a Thursday. We had our first meeting in that hotel. I just invited people. Some students came. I said, guys, we're going to start. We're going to have this every Saturday right here in this, in this hotel. So the following Saturday, we started. Believers Fellowship meetings. Students started coming. In 1990, I graduated, handed this off to Davis, who was a student at medical college. The work continued. And the work grew to more than 200 students meeting every Saturday. It became a church. They started meeting on Sundays. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It was a student-run, student-led fellowship. And today, there are students around the world whose lives have been changed through what happened in that fellowship. How did it happen? How did it come? There's no voice saying, go do this. Amen? So you step out on that directive. You step out on that instruction. And God carries things out. The inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Maybe I'll share one or two more stories and then we'll pray. November 22nd, 1993. In 1993, the early part of the, night of the year, I said, God, this year I have to find my wife. I need to find whom I'm going to get married to. So May 4th, 1993, I wrote down in my notebook. I still have that notebook. I just opened it a couple of days ago to look at it again. Here's what I want in my wife. So I wrote it all down. I said, here's what I can give to my wife. I wrote it all down. So I started praying. I was in the U.S. I continued to write letters uh, to the leaders in Manipal, the fellowship there. Uh, you know, those days... Email wasn't really easy. You had to pay for every letter. <laughs> so it was much easier to write letters. So we used to write letters to encourage the leaders. One of the leaders I was writing to was Amy. Uh, she was one of the worship leaders in Manipal. And I was based there in New Jersey. But I remember now, November 22nd, 1993. Please don't try this. I'm just sharing my experience. <laughs> I'm just sharing my experience. I was doing graduate work there. So I came back to my room where I was staying, and I was praying in tongues. While I was praying in tongues, the inner voice of the Holy Spirit said, write to Amy. Ask her if she would be willing to consider the possibility of marrying you. Now, Amy and I had never seen each other. We never met. Amy's in Manipal, I'm in New Jersey. We never seen each other. Probably exchanged about four letters, but those are all very formal, you know, do this, <laughs> formal letters. But here was that. And I said, God, I've never done something like this. <laughs> if this goes wrong, <laughs> it is the end of the preacher. <laughs> That's it. But I prayed a simple prayer. I said, God, Prepare Amy to receive this letter. And with much fear and trembling, <laughs> I just wrote the letter. I still have the letter. We still have those letters. So number 22nd, 1993, I, was right, I wrote the letter. Now here's what happened. Number 22nd, 1993, in Manipal. Amy sitting with a friend having tea. I don't know this friend. She doesn't, I mean, other than the fact that I was a leader of that group, I, I've never interacted with this friend. She's talking to Amy and he says, Amy, Consider this hypothetical situation. What if Ashish writes to you and asks you to marry him? This is now about 22nd, 1993. It's wild. <laughs> Ten days later, Amy receives the letter. She receives the letter. And the rest is history. <laughs> but we had... But we had, one of the very important things for us was approval from our parents. So look, uh, of course, the next letter, we, we kind of put down things. So these things are important for us. 
I shared what was important for me. She shared things that were important. And one of the things was both our parents should say yes. Amy's parents were in Malaysia. My parents were in Bangalore. And the wonderful thing was both our parents gave us the approval. You know. And so that's how we proceeded. But here was an, here's an example of the inner voice of the Spirit. I didn't hear an audible voice. There was no lightning and thunder. There was no, you know, angels blowing the trumpets, nothing. It was just an inner voice of the Spirit, a clear statement from the Holy Spirit. Same thing, that's how we started APC Bangalore when we came back. Uh, January of 2001, you know, we were looking for places. Where do we start the church? And we had some great plans. We'll do some big crusades and all of that. Nothing, none of that materialized. And so towards the end of January, I was a little discouraged. I was saying, God, we moved back. The whole purpose was to start a church. We're finding it so difficult. What should we do? And while I was praying, uh, early part of February, while I was praying, I said, God, what do we do? Not finding a place. Where do we start? The Lord simply spoke. Very simple statement. The inner voice of the Spirit. Very clear. Start with what you have. Very clear. Oh, it's that simple. And that time he was staying with my dad in Antinaga. So I went to my dad. I said, Dad, would you mind, would it be okay if we start in our home? He said, yeah, it's fine. That's how APC started. February 18th, 2001, we started in the home. You put all the people together, our family, the maids, and everybody together. We had 12 people. <laughs> I started the church. But God said, start with what you have. And like this, many other things. The way we started APC East was the same way. Uh, 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 this was in uh, 2012. And I think it was uh, August of 2012. I've uh, got the months down. Uh, we, we went to Manipal House in September 2012. Uh, so in June, July 2012, we, one of our young men faced, had an accident. He was admitted to Manipal Hospital. So I, I just went to the hospital to visit him. Now in the hospital, the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Some of our young men were standing around. The Holy Spirit said, what are you doing with all these young people? So, okay. Start church in Whitefield with these people. So right there in the hospital, standing next to the bed, I said, guys, we're going to start APC East. I'm like, I'd gone to do a hospital visit. I'm telling these guys, we're going to start APC East. Why? Because of the inner voice of the Holy. September 2002, like a month, month later, we found the place, started APC East with those young men. Now, most of them have gone abroad, relocated, but they were the core team. But how did it happen? In a hospital, unexpected place, but you're listening to the voice of the Spirit. He can speak to you in unexpected places. Amen? And I can share stories with you about the business and how things in the area of business, how the Holy Spirit, the inner voice of the Holy Spirit led us in different ways. But this morning, I just want to bring our attention. To this, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us as the children of God. He guides us by his inner witness and by his inner voice or the voice of the Spirit. We must train our own spirit, train our own spirit to listen to the Holy Spirit. He will do his part. He is doing his part. If we are not listening, sharpen, sharpen that, fine tune it. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Because as a believer, two primary ways you and I are going to be led. By the word of God and by the spirit of God. Amen. We'll continue this next Sunday. Let's rise to our feet, please. Thank you for your patient listening. As you're standing here, just a few more minutes and we close. I want you to pray for yourself and just say, Lord, help me to listen to the Holy Spirit. Help me to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because this is real. This is what God said the Holy Spirit will do for every believer. Every believer. I'm not somebody privileged. I'm just another child of God. 
he can work like this. That even more in your life. Father, we just thank you for the amazing ways in which you work. You are our God. You are our Lord. We bow before you, Father. Lord, I just pray that for each one of us, each and every one of us, we will learn to hear the Holy Spirit. That we will respond to the inner witness and the inner voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we will be led by the Spirit. May the Spirit of God become so real to each one of us. May He become our best friend. May He become our counselor, our guide. Help us, O oh God, each one of us, to recognize the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit and the inner voice of the Spirit. Help us. May our eyes be open, may our ears be open, may our hearts be open. Help us. We thank you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Grow in these things. Amen. It's an exciting journey to live and walk with the Spirit of God. God bless you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.